actually came out of the, the end of the Civil War. Actually, they started doing it before the end of the Civil War. But it was officially established three years after the Civil War ended, um, 1868. Um, but people began decorating the graves of Civil War soldiers before the war actually ended. Um, it was officially made a national holiday in 1971, which I was kind of surprised about. Um, but it had been a state holiday before that. And that 71 was also when it was established as the last Monday in May. Before that, it was always celebrated from 1868 until 1970 on May 30th. Uh, but now we, of course, observe it on the last Monday, which is coming up. And it was, I had this question and I made sure I looked it up so that I wouldn't say it wrong, um, but it was generally considered just um, a holiday to observe Civil War soldiers until World War I. And that's when it expanded to all um, American soldiers. So first off here, we have Mr. Alan Mollison here. Uh, passed away in 1906. He is a Scottish immigrant, came to America at age four. He was a blacksmith by trade. Um, and when the Civil War broke out and President Lincoln made his first call for volunteers, there was not yet a recruiting station in Austin. That recruiting station would eventually be located at the headquarters building, which was downtown. And if you were here for Hump Day History Live week one, you got a sneak peek at the headquarters building. But anyways, um, since we did not yet have a recruiting station in Austin, uh, Mr. Mollison here walked to Faribault to enlist there um, and joined the 1st Minnesota Regiment and became the first to enlist from Mower County, even though he didn't enlist here. Um, he enlisted in April 1961. He took part in uh, the first Battle of Bull, Bull Run, where his captain was shot and he actually ran out amongst the fire to bring him back to safety, but unfortunately his captain passed away. Um, he was also part of the Peninsular Campaign with McClellan and was at Antietam and Gettysburg. Um, and he was also with General Grant at one point. He was wounded twice. He was a POW at Belle Isle for about three weeks. Um, his brother Thomas was killed with the Union Army and his brother Edwin was killed with the Confederate Army. So a split family there, very common during the Civil War. Um, after the war, he returned to Austin as a blacksmith, and then he was also elected sheriff uh, for four years, and then became a traveling salesman for the Minneapolis Harvester Company. He uh, then was re-elected sheriff, served for 15 years, uh, he was very involved with the GAR, Grand Army of the Republic, here in town, um, and it's, I thought it was interesting, you can learn a lot about people from their obituaries, but especially the old obituaries, they were great sources of information and Mr. Mollison here said that well Mr. Mollison was a man who was much in politics he was not a politic man being frank and outspoken on all matters and then he was also very close friends with another soldier that we're going to talk about uh, probably one of my favorites in Moore County history just because his name is fun to say Percy Bump great guy um, but it said that when Alan here was in the hospital Bump convinced, or Percy convinced the doctor to let him in the room to say goodbye, but he promised not to talk. And as about as Percy was about to leave the room after sitting with uh, Alan for a while, Alan reached up to grab his hand and said, Goodbye, Al. Or Percy said goodbye, Al, and then Al responded, Goodbye, old Perse. That was their last interaction. And I just think it's really great that that was recorded for us. So, yeah. So we are going to move on here to George Beard, and if you want to get a quick shot, if you didn't, of the, the draped urn, I thought I uh, we could talk about that real quick, but the, the urn on a cemetery stone was thought to symbolize the body, and then the shrouded urn is believed to symbolize that the body has, or that the soul has left the body and gone to heaven. Did a quick little Google search on that before we went live. There's a couple other examples, you see that on several different stones throughout the cemetery. If we notice any more, we'll take some pictures as we start walking. There's a lot of great herbs, especially in this part of the cemetery because it's where a lot of the older stones are. There's another one over there like that. Yeah. So I'm going to walk and talk or yell. Try not to trip, don't trip. Yep. <laughs> and we're going to make our way back to uh, Mr. Bear. Baird. Probably a familiar name to those of you who are um, or in the know with Mower County history. It's a big name in the early years. It's like paparazzi. <laughs> um, we'll talk about Mr. Baird while we go. I can walk and talk back, walk back and talk, right? 
and his wife moved to Racine, Wisconsin, and then in 1856, they moved here to Dora County. He preempted a section in Lansing Township and built a lock house. It said that he had $10 in worldly goods when he and his wife came to Moore County that December. Um, he split rails to earn money for food, but they didn't stay on their claim long. And then he, uh, they sold it and then he did carpenter work. And he also helped build the headquarters building. Again, the building we talked about in week one of Hosting History. We're getting there and I'm out of oh. breath, man. <laughs> oh yeah, there he is, right there. <laughs> George Baird, he's on the left. This is a family plot. So there's George and his wife, Charlotte. So in 1861, they moved to Austin and he started working on his home. Uh, but the Civil War interrupted his building and he became the first man from Austin to enlist in Company K in October and they were part of the 4th Minnesota Infantry. He held the rank of Lieutenant when he was discharged in August of 1865. And the records, his uh, records stated that he was prompt, brave, and courteous. What better uh, compliment is there? He became postmaster when he returned to Austin, uh, but soon resigned and was elected sheriff. He passed away in January 1895 in California, and he had gone to California in the hopes that the weather would help restore his health, um, but it didn't work. And they sent his body back here, and the GAR met his body at the train depot and accompanied it back home to his home, and they had like a whole procession along the street that followed behind his casket. And it said that the funeral was very well attended despite the bitter cold because January, Minnesota, not a pleasant time. Um, in 1935 then, he, well, let's back up. After the Civil War, the flag that Company K had carried into all of their battles, uh, which had been presented to them by the women of Moore County before they left, um, the men of Company K voted to give the flag to George Bear. And he kept it, and his family kept it, and they passed it down, and it, at one point they, it was framed, I believe, and then in 1935, his family uh, donated the flag to be displayed at the library. At the time, it was Carnegie Library in town. And then uh, later on, I think 50s or 60s, I did not look up the exact date, that flag was then given to the Historical Society. And in 2010, or 2009, 2010, um, we had it professionally conserved and reframed and stabilized because it's made out of silk, so it's a little fragile. And that is still on display at the Historical Society today. And we have George and his family uh, to thank for that. It's a really great piece of Moore County history that we're lucky to still have um, preserved and be able to share. So that was George. There's his family plot.
and in January of 1863, he was part of a group that left for Nashville. He was captured at the Battle of Spring Hill and then sent to Libby Prison in Nashville. He was released after three months and sent back. Um, in March of 1864, he was commissioned as a first lieutenant and then in May took command of his company, Company H. Um, he spoke about his experiences in the Civil War during the 1906 ceremony to um, dedicate the GAR memorial. He's over here. Okay, so it's those stones? Yeah, it's a family plot again. Um, he is right here, the one that says Father. He uh, suffered from sunstroke during the war and he spent hours, 12 hours unconscious. Uh, he was taken by ambulance to a hospital and then trained um, to a larger hospital in Chattanooga. He said the first voice he heard was that of a northern nurse and he said it was the sweetest sound he'd ever heard besides his mother's voice. <laughs> yeah. um, and then in 18, April 1865, he took part in the large victory march in Washington. If I remember correctly, that victory march lasted three days. They had, they had so many soldiers marching. Um, he received a pension uh, that says he almost died of sunstroke, so that was his um, that was his pension. He and his wife had eight children, and in the late 1860s, they moved to um, the Moore County area. They moved into Austin in 1892, um, and they fun little fact: when they remodeled their house in 1904. They were the first ones to use concrete blocks manufactured in Austin by uh, Mr. Crane, and that's what they used to raise the foundation. He was a very, very active member in the GAR post here in Austin. He spent 40 years as an officer in the post, including commander. Um, he worked closely with the Women's Relief Corps to bring the uh, GAR memorial to Oakwood that we're gonna hopefully venture over to see next. Um, and he was also responsible for working very hard to get all the veterans' graves marked with a marker by the state. Because when they first started burying uh, Civil War veterans here, they didn't necessarily have markers for everybody. Um, he served as a city alderman with a few years off here and there. Um, and then where I said he had kind of an interesting life, uh, his battle with sunstroke was the first time he cheated death. Uh, in June 1903, said that a group of GAR veterans were fishing when a violent storm broke out just as they were hitching up to go home and they gathered under a tree not always a good plan the tree was hit by lightning <laughs> percy and another man were thrown to the ground and one of the teams the horse teams was knocked down but there were no serious injuries injuries then again fishing july 1906 he almost drowns he was wearing long hip wader boots and he waded out to a dam and lost his balance and then his boots filled with water and he almost couldn't get out of the water. <laughs> Percy. Uh, he also he had a hunting accident in 1906, September 1906. And then in July of 1914, he fell from a load of hay and sprained his ankle and then injured his neck and back. Uh, he was bedridden for several years before his death, which, I mean, he cheated death about four times. so. Um, and it said that, his obituary again said that, we knew him well and we knew him long, a good citizen, kindly father, splendid and true neighbor. Uppermost in his heart and the like interest of his family was his love and loyalty to his land. And he was 86 years old when he passed away, so he lived uh, quite a long time. Um, he's a, I just love Percy. I don't know. There's some people in
made out of Vermont granite, and it was cut by a man named Drew Daniel in Vermont, and it was ordered by Sven Anderson and son of Austin, who are the ancestors of the Anderson Monument here in town. And I think they celebrated 150 years ago.